Okay. Tere, good afternoon. Hi, everybody. Some of you I recognize from the seminar, some maybe new. Uh, my name is Wolfgang Wagner. I am from the University of Linz in Austria. I have been uh, around in my career at some places, for example, been at Los Angeles, Mexico City, Rio de Janeiro, Cambridge, UK, Paris, places for guest professorships and things like that. Now I'm here in Tartu, which makes me very happy because I like the city very much. It's not so big to lose oneself and it's easy to orient. So I'm really, and it's beautiful above all, so I like it. Uh, we will uh, conduct six hours, six units of lecture on social and societal psychology. And the, uh, how shall I say, how shall we assess your achievements? I think I suggest to have a little exam at the end where I will give you five or six written questions and you write a paragraph or so about this question. It will not be multiple choice, it will be uh, English text, okay? And according to the, to the points that you get in the exam, you will be judged. Judged. You will be uh, given a, how, how do you say, a note? Uh, as, sorry? A grade, right, great. Ah, thank you very much. Yes, right. Just a brief note at the beginning. Uh, sometimes you may be surprised about the content of my talk and of my presentation. Uh, just don't despair. Bear with me because I will try to make a connection between everything. So let's start. What is this? This is a... Beg your pardon? Yes, 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 after the lecture. And for this lecture, it will be only next week because I'm out of house, out of town for the weekend, so, okay? Well, that's a probe, a space probe. And it's called Voyager 1 or Voyager 2. And they started a long time ago, 1977, in uh, on August and September. And they have been traveling quite a long distance. For example, 20 billions of kilometers in the meantime from the sun, not from the earth, because when you travel within the solar system, you measure distance from the sun. So the light time is a very long time. So to communicate with these probes is uh, quite impressive because at present, it must be about six, 36 or 37 hours. When I prepared the slide, it was a little bit less. And you can find still official information on the probes at the NASA website. They travel with a speed approximately 56,000 kilometers per hour on the course leaving, leaving the solar system. And uh, well, that's the different things that they have on board. And it's a surprise to have their, to, to still see that they can uh, create electricity, which is achieved, I think, by a very small uh, radioactive battery and the solar panels. But the solar panels don't work very well beyond Pluto. Um, that's where they are approximately. That's the structure of the <laughs> solar system. You see, we are in the middle of social psychology. Uh, the Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth is about here. And so Earth is one, one uh, astronomical unit from the, per definition, from the Sun. And here at the heliosphere or heliopause is the, so to say, the limit of the solar system. And the termination shock is the area where the solar particles 
collide with the interstellar particles. And that's approximately the place where these two probes are in the, in the moment. And they are sending quite interesting magnetic data about this area that we didn't know before. But uh, uh, if they traveled for more the next 80,000 years, they would actually meet the first closest star with potentially some uh, planets around it. But I'm not sure if we can experience that, if uh, humankind will live so long, particularly taking into account the, 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 the time that the light and the signal will need to arrive at the Earth. But the most important thing for us here, social scientists, is the golden record. Both have a so-called golden record on board. And this golden record, uh, you people probably don't even know what a record is. Record, <laughs> these big black things that you played on record player. <laughs> it's called long play or vinyl things. And this is a vinyl made of gold, so it's a gold if you want. And this has a lot of information on it. You can see here uh, an explanation of the recording. There is the position of the Earth in, in, in the solar system and with relation to the next stars. There is information on how to read this record. And on the back side of this record are, uh, well, recordings. And the contents of these recordings are pictures that explain a little bit the Earth, drawings, images, etc., etc. Then there are greetings in uh, many different human languages to the ETs, extraterrestrial organisms, and the selection of sounds from the Earth, among them also the noise that the whales make underwater. Ooh, something like that. So the people will be surprised to hear our language. Uh, but what, uh, yeah, these are images that are still uh, in the recording itself. You can see images of family. There is also images of men and women standing beside each other of a fetus, you can see. And a scene from a Chinese school. And the greetings, uh, for example, the Greek greeting is this here. No, does it not work? Hmm? Interesting. No. Well, anyway, there are greetings in many different languages. I wanted to record that to show them to you because particularly the, the, the Chinese greeting is very welcoming. So uh, I, I have attached, but it somehow has a problem, I notice. Um, they're inviting, they're saying that we're happy to greet you and we have been thinking about you and we would, be, would feel lucky if you visited us which I'm not sure is a good idea to invite them to us. But as I said, probably we won't be living anymore in this recognizable format that we have now. But the more interesting thing maybe for us is what does this tell us about mankind? This tells us, I think, in my opinion, a lot about mankind. It tells, for all, uh, above all, the importance of communication that we put, that we humans put in our life. We have a desire for contact. We have an affiliation desire. We uh, perhaps also want to show off how civilized and how technically developed we are and show some pride of being humans in a, humans in a way. And that's maybe one of the motivations why the United Nations selected all these different greetings, the different pictures and photos 
that are recorded on this golden record. Um, what is the prerequisite of communicating? I mean, it will be relatively difficult to communicate with ETs, even if uh, the probes meet some of them, because even on Earth we have a little problem in communication. So what are the prerequisites? On the one hand, we can say that the most likely case with ETs is that we have no shared sign system with each other. That is, we have no language that we can share, uh, neither acoustically nor visually. Uh, the next step would, could be actually that we have a shared sign system, that we speak the same language. Uh, but in the absence of a shared representational system, we won't be able to communicate because even if you are using the same sound for the words that we use, probably the meaning behind the words may be different. For example, if I ask you, are you the third, uh, the third rebirth of the holy dog, or are you not? Can you tell me, yes or no? Well, she's quiet <laughs> because obviously she has a problem not to understand English. She understands English, but she has a problem with the representation behind the concepts that I was using. Because a holy dog, rebirth, etc., etc., is not part of our, of our cultural system in a way. And therefore, there is no answer to the question. So we understand the language, but we didn't understand the meaning. And of course, at the end, the best uh, way to communicate is to share a language and, of course, to share also the representational system that uh, allows us to do a communication. So language and Symbolic language and communication is one of the standards, one of the biggest achievements that humankind could achieve or achieved during its evolution. To arrive at a technological state where, the, where we could send probes out, traveling millions and billions of kilometers, and to carry a message for the ETs uh, in them. Uh, okay, so far to communication. Let's now talk about ducks and men. In, at the University of Linz, we have uh, a building, a department building, and right in front of the department building are a, is a lake, a little one. And on this lake we have ducks and other waterfowl, and sometimes the old women come and bring old bread to the ducks and to the waterfowl to feed them. And whenever an, uh, a grandmother comes and opens her, water, uh, her, her paper bag, <coughs> making this sound, the ducks hear the sound and come <coughs> rapidly swim towards the, swim towards the grandmother. To be, to be fed. This is a movement that we, can we call it acting? Is the duck acting or is it behaving? What would you say? Is it acting or behaving? What, what would you, sorry? Be, behaving. Why don't we say acting? Well, there is a big purpose to be fed. No, I said that she is not uh, thinking about it. She will do it, like to show oh. something. So you mean she has no planning? Yes. The duck has no planning to in the background. Okay. Sometimes I doubt if humans have a planning in direct. <laughs> but even if we don't have planning, there is another distinctive uh, uh, attribute that action has in contrast to behavior. 
or must have in contrast to behavior, that is to be accountable. Action can be accounted for. I do have justifications for what I do. Or I can always invent some or produce some. So the difference is the accounts and the justifications at the end. So whenever we talk about human behavior, actually we're talking about action. Whereas when, and action is also the concept that we as actors use. I'm not talking about myself as behaving. I'm talking about myself as acting. My act at present is teaching, okay? Uh, I wouldn't say about me, I'm behaving as if I were teaching. That sounds strange. And I can always justify why I am here standing and talking. So there is difference between the use of the word behavior and acting, whereas behavior itself is a, an observer term, a term that we use when we observe another organism uh, moving around. And we talk about the behavior. Except when we talk or are interested in the reasons for the behavior of this organism. And when we are in a situation where we can ask the, per, the, the organism about his or her uh, intentions, justifications, etc., then we may switch as an observer to talking about acting. So there is a difference between acting and behavior. But there is also a, uh, a difference between natural and social. Or is there a difference between natural and social? I'm not sure. This looks very natural, doesn't it? It is natural. Nature. Uh, this looks very social, isn't it? It's a group of people. And this looks like an artifact. Uh, also social, because we need a society to construct these things. We need architects, we need uh, building uh, companies, etc. And uh, we call this nature. I forgot to translate this, sorry. This means nature. But the problem is uh, another one. These we call individuals, and these we call artifacts, of course. But, uh, and this, of course, we call, what is written here? I cannot read it myself. Uh, nothing yet. Oh, sorry, it's uh, called group, okay? But the question is, is this really nature, or isn't it part of our social imaginary, part of our ideal picture of nature, a lake, some mountains, forest, uh, a meadow, grass. Is it not that we, that the nature that we see here that is not at all natural, but actually very socialized by our way of thinking about it? And as we are communicating within a society, talking about this wonderful place of nature, it gets actually socialized. So what we should always keep in mind, and that's not so difficult for sociologists, a little bit more difficult for psychologists, is that natural and social is not a really strict difference between the two. That you always need to define uh, what you understand by natural and why it should not be social. Because in the moment that we talk about some tree, for example, this tree, becomes a social object, because we talk about it in terms of certain, of certain concepts. We talk about it as owners of the forest, and we think about the value that this tree would have if we cut it down and sell it, etc., etc. Or if we are hiking through the forest, we look at the tree in a very different manner, but still we look at the tree in a socialized way. So what uh, social psychology deals with have different, uh, let's say, descriptive spaces or conceptual descriptions. 
we can describe things. I'm not jumping to different topics that may later go together. That's why we have these changes in the, in the content of the overhead uh, projection. We can talk about uh, events on the individual level, of course, and on the collective level. The collective level usually is described very well by an orchestra and this, uh, being more than the sum of its uh, instruments, uh, building an entity on the collective level. Many individuals build an entity that create uh, something new out of the sum of the instruments in an orchestra, for, for example. And in modern music, this is often called a groove that comes out. In fact, in fact, it's a strange phenomenon for those of you who play an instrument in a group or in a band or whatever will know what I mean. Because sometimes when you're playing, you get, when it's really running well, you get the impression that the music is playing you and you're not playing the music. The, the, the group or the whole thing, the whole presence of the music is playing you and moving you, which is at the end the ideal groove that you can create in a, in a band. So conceptual descriptions about within social psychology always must be located on the individual or collective level. Then we have conceptual areas that may allow us to explain things. On the one hand, we can say, OK, a phenomenon is caused or created by genetic determination of us humans. That would be a natural explanation, or of course the nurture explanation, where we say that a particular way of socialization and experience have created the, the here and there for, of a certain individual. And sometimes in media we can read uh, sentences like that, there is a gene for this and that, which is of course, of course scientifically completely incorrect because there is not one gene for certain behaviors, but many genes, for example, also for intelligence. Intelligence is determined by many, many genes that act together in a certain way. But what we usually forget by this contraposition of nature-nurture is that the two are in a way related because we must explain what socialization is and how it works. And if we analyze the process of socialization, we come to learning processes and must discover that these learning processes are genetically determined, preformed. Without the genetic apparatus that allows us to learn, we will not be able to be socialized. So it's always not an additive relationship between nature and nurture, saying that, let's say, 60% of our behavior or of our individuality are, uh, by socialization, nurtured by our education, and 40% by genes. It's more like this. It's interacting in a way that is inseparable. You cannot separate the two. To explain a little bit, to give an example, Let's look at Henry Tatchfeld's group experiments. Uh, maybe some of you heard about Henry Tatchfeld, social psychologist uh, working in the 70s and 80s. A long time ago for you, I know, but one of the more important social psychologists in European social psychology. He developed something that can be called the minimal group paradigm and had the following design. He asked several students to come to his lab. Hmm? One, they were uh, coming in one after the other. One got a, a how do you say, a, when you bind something around your head, how you call it? Sorry? Turban? Well, not a turban, just a what do you say? Scarf. Uh, something like a <laughs> scarf in a certain color. So the first student got a red, 
band or whatever you call this. The second got a blue band. The third one got a red again. The next one a blue. So by completely random, uh, in a random way, he assigned the students to, or the subjects in this case, the subjects to something that looked like a blue group and something that looked like, yeah, like a red group. And then he observed what they were doing. He left the room and observed with camera or whatever. And what do you think happened during the time he was out? Well, they affiliated with the same color students. The red group was forming, the blue group was forming, and then they were standing together and talking and, and guessing what is this about. But the real target of the, or the aim of the experiment was of course to see what they do, and they did it. They got together to form groups that could be called right, uh, red and blue. Uh, then he, the, form, the groups were formed, then he had them sit down and write an essay. Everybody wrote an essay, he collected the essays, went out. Uh, a little bit later he came back with a pack of essays that were uh, supposed to be judged or graded by students, by, 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 the sub, oh, uh, by the, how should I say, by the subjects, by the respondents. And uh, he gave uh, uh, an essay from the blue group, supposedly from the blue group, to a red person, and also uh, an essay supposedly from the red group to, the red, to, to a red person, and vice versa. He gave a red essay and a blue essay to a blue person to judge. So everybody of the of the two groups uh, of the whole participants had an essay to grade. So these essays, of course, were artificial. They were developed before, and they were completely identical in value. But you can already anticipate the result. What was the result? The result was that in the average, the red group or red people judged the Red, paper, red essay better than the blue essay in the average, even though they were the same uh, across the board. And the blue group did the same. They overestimated the value of the blue essays and underestimated the value of the red essays. So what do we have here? Are the, the, is this phenomenon, can this be explained more by uh, a social, psychological, or biologic, biological cause or reason? Uh, it's difficult to say because the, this behavior is very spontaneous and actually we are primed from our birth on to be social animals, to affiliate with others. So we cannot say that it's an, only a, an educational outcome. It's also a result of our genetic outfit. And it's psychologically at the same time, of course, because it involves psychological judgment, psychological processes that lead to the fact that people uh, affiliate and talk to each other. And of course, it's also a social process. So how shall we call the result or explain, try to explain the result? It's neither completely social, neither completely nurture, nor completely nature. It's something in between. So what I want to say here is that it's in most, the majority of cases, it's wrong to say that uh, a, a social phenomenon or a human phenomenon is only genetic or only social. It is always the interaction between the two. And later we will come to the prime example of this which is language learning by children. Languages are what are something really fundamentally human and fundamentally social because they serve language serves communication between people, which is a social process. But how children attain local languages 
is uh, deeply governed by genetic uh, uh, preconditions. But we come to this later. Anyway, uh, these two orientations have been, have sources or let's say, let's say roots in the whole history of psychology and also of the social sciences. We have this socially oriented social psychology where the role of the groups and of the social conditions are overemphasized in a way. And then we have the individually oriented social psychology where individual processes are being overemphasized. Just to give a quick overview on, the, on a few people that are there. Wilhelm Wundt was the only one who really developed both sites, the individual, experimental, cognitive, uh, psychology and the social side of human behavior in his, I think it's 10 volumes of Volker Psychologie or the Psychology of the Peoples, uh, where he states that the primary form of human conviviality is the culture collective. But he never forgot about the individual side and investigated them in his psychometric. Uh, psychometric measurements and experiments. Another person who tended completely to one side was Le Bon. He uh, was interested only in the mass uh, events or mass effects that create, that are, can, that can be observed in uh, big units of human groups in, in masses, so to say. And on the other side of the Atlantic, we have Allport who was a complete individualist and gave birth to the still very individualistically oriented American, US American social psychology. For him, there is nothing like, a, like a, an emergence of a, let's say, of a group phenomenon out of the interaction of people, but the uh, sum of individual attitudes, of individual actions is always uh, not more than the sum. The sum of interaction is just the sum of the interaction, not like an orchestra, like in an orchestra, the collectively produced music, which is different from the sum of the individuals. Um, that's uh, different levels. We sh first uh, have the problem or discuss the problem with individual level and the collective level. We have the problem of explanation, shall we tend more to social or natural explanations? And we have these different uh, approaches in the history of social psychology. Um, let's talk about this study. An ethologist made a study in front of discotheques. There he first made photos of the female attendants, so the people who visited this discotheque at the entrance. He asked them if they would be willing to let uh, him make a photo. And this photo was uh, accompanied by a test of the saliva. They had to spit into an aprovet in order to test the hormonal status of the woman. And the photos were being analyzed automatically with a computer on the percentage of skin that could be seen. As the, in other words, the sexiness of the dress. And a few days later, they contacted the uh, women again and asked them if they have had intercourse during that period, uh, during that evening or the following evenings with a man. So he was testing more or less the sexual readiness uh, and preparedness of the women going to this thing. And what he really found was, according to this curve of female, this sexual desire that the uh, there was a significantly higher probability to have had intercourse 
when they were close to their, uh, uh, when the females were close to their ovulation, to their most fecund uh, period. And this correlated highly with the sexiness of the clothes. The more skin that was visible in the average correlated with the readiness to have sexual intercourse. And this was oriented around the ovulation time. So the problem is, how shall we explain this? Is this a cultural phenomenon? Is this a natural phenomenon? Is this completely genetic? Because our hormonal makeup and the, the processes that we have in our bodies are in the end genetic? Or is it cultural? Because obviously the cloth clothing was involved in a way which is a deeply cultural uh, system of signaling. It's hard to say. Again, we have a, a situation where the two things go together like that. And you cannot separate the physiological, genetic, biological basis of our human beings, uh, of us being human beings, and the cultural expression of certain processes in the biological realm. So there are no social events that are neither purely natural or purely genetic and also not purely social because they are everything that happens in our social lives has a, a natural basis on a, certain, on a certain level. And then there is this. When we come to a different culture, a different region of the earth, we have problems to distinguish the people because they look, all look alike, particularly when you come to a region that is not uh, populated by the people that we are used to, the Caucasian race, so to say. If you go to Africa or if you go to Asia, you always have this problem if you don't know a person very well. And the effect was easily, dis, uh, easily measured by if you give ca uh, Caucasian participants Asian faces or Caucasian faces to recognize they have a problem or they are much, more, much less able to recognize Asian faces than Caucasian faces and the same for the Asian participants in the rivers which is not surprising because we know this experience from our own uh, traveling. And of course, the whole thing is, the whole phenomenon is located in the so-called fusiform. This uh, lower part of the backside of the brain, uh, the exact opposite of the frontal lobe, very close to the, to the, uh, very close to the uh, visual center that is in the cuneus, for example. And what is this for? Um, does it have any, any sense? Uh, I would say yes, it makes sense to know very well, to be able to discriminate the faces that you're confronted with in your local community in order to judge others, to learn who is trustworthy, who is not trustworthy, to uh, develop a trust-based social life within your group, no? And still, it is something that uh, is determined again by biology at the same time as by social experience, because it, on the one hand, it depends on where we live, and it's not hardwired uh, genetically, but still, the genetic process allows us to pr take profit of the genetic basis in order to uh, develop our social life in discriminating uh, trustworthy and less trustworthy people. So what is, at the end, societal psychology? Psycholo uh, social psycholo uh, societal psychology is a part of social psychology and has attempts, actually, to bridge 
the notorious gap between individualistic and collectivistic explanations. It, uh, it is an attempt or an insight that uh, the really relevant social events and, and things that happen cannot be explained either on the individual level only or on the collective level. Uh, then uh, societal psychology is also interested in uh, looking at and understanding societally relevant uh, areas where things are getting socially hot, so to say. And one of the approaches that is central to the societal approach is social representation theory and other uh, social constructivist theories within social psychology. We are uh, going to talk about different themes that, in my opinion, have to do with societal psychology. That is first the, how humans and culture came about, how the mind, the human mind, might have developed across the human evolution. Uh, we will discuss methods in social sciences and some strange strange things in the, method, uh, in the methods. We talk about language and discourse a, a little bit. Also about belief, knowledge and social representations. And uh, about social construction. And finally about groups and the decline of cultures and societies. So you see it's a little a mix of many things. And due to the short term of the three months that we share together, uh, I had to select certain topics and not everything can be covered. The relevant literature has been mentioned, I think, on the, on the Moodle website or wherever, wherever or not yet. Or we will system. put it on the study information system. And we, I will put, the, of course, the, the, the PowerPoint on the study information system or Moodle. And uh, also other literature that may be of help that might help you to get a, an understanding of the things. Uh, we don't need this literature here. Now let's start with another topic. Get in the middle of the things. So what about the development of cultures? Uh, in the, between the two wars, there were archaeological ex expeditions to Iraq, to a, the place which is now called Iraq. And there is a place in the north of Iraq, Shanidar, where they discovered a series of burials, of graves of uh, Neanderthals, Homo sapiens neanderthalensis. This, uh, these graves were quite old, six, <coughs> about 60,000 years ago. They were <coughs> uh, made. And what they discovered, the, the, anthropolo uh, the anthropologists and the archaeologists discovered, was that there might have been some social components to the burial. First, they saw that the way the dead were buried Buried uh, involved a certain body posture. They were buried in a sitting position, but lying on the side. And second, they found lots of flower pollen, of pollen of flowers that grow in the vicinity. OK. Uh, one uh, one uh, idea that the archaeologists had was that the dead person was honored by the compatriots, by, him, by them throwing flowers into the grave. That's one possible explanation that will point to a highly developed symbolic understanding of these Neanderthals. 
a critical voice would say, okay, the pollen can be blown by the wind from, from the flowers that were around. So we cannot decide this. But the squatting posture of the dead person is not an influence of the wind, but was uh, formed intentional, where we can say that they had a certain idea of how to bury people, because they first, they didn't leave them rotting on the field or in the forest. They dug a hole and put them in the hole, but not just anyhow. They formed, they took, they brought them into a, a, a particular position to, to uh, be buried in, in this position. Maybe thinking about some afterlife or whatever. I don't know. Or we don't know, actually. But anyway, this indicates that we have a very early understanding or the roots of culture in a very archaeologically very deep, uh, uh, deep uh, layer. 60,000 years ago was the high time of Neanderthal rule in the Near East and in Iraq. And uh, that was also the time when the Homo sapiens sapiens, the other subspecies, went out of Africa, and uh, a species that was extremely similar to, to the Neanderthals. We see the, uh, a skull of the early modern U uh, European and of the Homo sapiens neanderthalensis that are relatively similar, uh, just different in certain very, very uh, particular differences. For example, the thick eyebrow with the Neanderthals, the strong eyebrow is uh, much less pronounced here with the modern human. And other features of this, the, the front, for example. But anyway, the difference is not big. That's why we call them subspecies and not two different species. Because obviously they seem to have procreated with each other, because all, we all still share in a few percent of Neanderthal genes, as we know from recent genetic studies. So there was a parallel existence for a long time between the two uh, subspecies. And the Neanderthals only disappeared completely 35,000 to 32,000 years ago, uh, which means a long time after the first cultural expression that we know of the Neanderthals from Shanida, from this burial. The problem is why could it be that uh, Homo sapiens Neanderthalensis lost out? Was he outnumbered by modern um, men or was uh, there a small evolutionary difference that led to a big evolutionary advantage in the long run from modern men? Uh, in any case, the simultaneous existence of these two species or subspecies at the same time is something that is for us nowadays very difficult to imagine. Because uh, we can't even coexist two people beside side by side if we see, if we look at the chronic conflicts that we have on Earth. So they existed 10,000 years side by side. They may have had quarrels and fights or whatever. But uh, uh, so, uh, at, one, at one point in time, the, the poor Neanderthals lost out and were finished. And the last Neanderthal probably died in the south of Spain, of the Spanish peninsula. But uh, this uh, outcompeting of one group out competing the other group can be nicely illustrated by natural selection experiment of bacteria here. You may say there is not a big, there is a big difference between bacteria and humans, of course there is, but the processes are exactly the same. So what we see here is an experiment with Escherichia coli, which is a well-known bacterium that is often used for experiments. Uh, there are the so-called normal E. coli uh, species, 
Uh, there is a species of E. coli with a mutation called TD10.3 that gives this strain of E. coli a disadvantage if they just drop into a, into a lactose-rich medium. It's a little bit similar to the people who have lactose intolerance. Uh, there is another strain of E. coli uh, with a TD10.4 mutation. This gives them an advantage in a lactose-rich medium. And you can see here the difference in evolution of the two groups. The upper group is the one with the disadvantage. And over time, they quickly uh, become less and less and less, whereas the uh, strain with a positive uh, with a, how shall I say, with an advantage relative to the surroundings, in this case the, the, the lactose medium, they grow more slowly than the others disappear, but they grow nevertheless. And you may imagine the coexistence of the two subspecies of uh, humans, uh, Homo sapiens sapiens, and Homo sapiens uh, neanderthalensis in a very similar way. So that's the more recent history of humankind, but you know that the history of humankind goes far more back, too many million years ago. And all the things that we know come from Eastern Africa, from the today the territory of Ethiopia and Kenya and Tanzania. And the most important thing that we discovered there was that very early in the evolution of the human species, in this case 3.7 years, million years ago, the first evidence for upright walking came up or were found in uh, volcanic ashes that were existed there. Uh, and they, here we could uh, discriminate already a relatively stable upright walking where we could discriminate and see exactly the imprint of the big toe in relation to the other toes. Because you know that the big toes of the apes and uh, of the big apes uh, look more like our thumb than a toe. But these already have a walking leg, in a way, a walking foot, which uh, shows us that they were walking upright. They must have changed the habitus of the skin, uh, hair, etc., etc., which was all uh, together an important evolutionary step towards a better energy use, towards avoiding uh, excessive sun expose, uh, ex, uh, exposure of the body, the hairless body in this case, and to have a better overview over the landscape if there is some predator coming or not. And of course, it liberated the hands for, for uh, manipulation, for using tools. So I don't want to go into the details of the human evolution thing. It should be enough to show you how the most important species starting with two million years ago uh, distributed across uh, the continents. So Homo ergaster is often another name for the Homo habilis, who was the first one where we saw the use of stone tools. Out of this uh, uh, species came two, two uh, twigs, so to say, two branches. On the first hand, the Homo erectus, who primarily populated Asia. That was the first human group that left Africa to populate other parts of Africa, in this case, Asia. And parallel to this, in Africa, you had the development of the Homo antecessor, who developed into the Neanderthalensis and the Homo sapiens. sapiens. And the Homo Neanderthalensis was the first to enter Europe. At the time, 
when the, when the Homo erectus already was in Asia and was in the down, uh, going down. And he was completely finished, the Homo erectus, when the Homo sapiens started to populate all of uh, Eurasia and only at the very last moment uh, also the Americas about 12 to 15,000 years ago. But that's just for the big impression. Uh, we can determine the migratory lineages, how human people have migrated across the continents by using two genetic characteristics. One is the Y chromosome that is uniquely inherited by men from the father. And that's the mitochondrial DNA, which is the DNA of a little uh, organellum in the human cells that helps us to create energy. This mitochondrial DNA is uniquely uh, inherited from the mother. So men and women inherit the mitochondrial DNA only from the mother. And the men, uh, additionally, the lineage, the, the, the male lineage from, from the father in the form of a Y chromosome. That's fine. But this shows us, or this is a tool that we can use to determine the, the, the migration routes. So not so much the migration routes of the Syrian refugees, but the migration routes out of Africa about 80,000 years ago. And just as an illustration, I want to show you my own genetic uh, migration. I had my genome analyzed. Uh, the mitochondrial maternal DNA, which departed obviously from a mitochondrial Eve 150,000 years ago in Africa, in <coughs> East Africa, went across uh, the Middle East and came directly to Europe. So, in a way, my maternal line was very Europe-oriented and immediately populated about 15,000 years ago the cro culture that existed in the west of Europe. At a time when there was in the north still the, the, glace, uh, the, the, the glacial times, the, the ice time. And my father's uh, forefathers' migration was a little bit more outstretching, leaving Africa about 50,000 years ago, going to Central Asia, and later turning to west, to a western route, and also arriving in Europe about 30,000 years ago in the Cro-Magnon culture, uh, where my father and mother have not met yet. No? But they were living more or less in, since that time in the refuge from the ice cold climate in the north of Europe. But you can, why I show this is that you can determine the, wonder, the routes that certain, that the people took out of the, out of the cradle of humankind, that is East, East Africa, into the wide world by checking the uh, statistical distribution of certain marker genes in our genomes. Um, we'll come back to this later in culture, uh, in the development of culture. But in this Pleistocenic time, which stretched from the beginning of, let's say, two, three, four million years ago, to the end of the ice uh, period, there must have happened something in the human mind that developed or that initiated an evolution in the human mind. Because in Africa, we have the Stone Age tool use that is the primarily the, the, the shaped, uh, the primitively shaped, uh, I don't know the English expression actually, 
In German, it's Faustkeil. Uh, that uh, a stone that you just shape a little bit to fit better in your hand, and you just hit something, and it works. And it uh, helps you to achieve some some uh, change in your food or whatever. But whatever, it's not doesn't matter how it is called. But uh, when the people arrive in in the Gromagnon time, in, in, in South France and in, in uh, Spain, they already had a different mind and were able to develop or to produce these wonderful uh, paintings that we see in the French, South Southern French uh, caves, the, the cave paintings. And this evolution of the human mind seems to be based on, on one uh, phenomenon. First, the development of modular structure of the brain. A modular structure of the brain is the following. When we look at our computers, they have a, a, a chip that is useful for doing many, many different things according to the programs that we throw at them. You know? We can write, we type, we can uh, browse in the internet, we can uh, make calculations with statistical programs, etc. The computer does this, but not as quick as a module. A module or a modular uh, chip, computer chip, is something that is very, very specialized. For example, doing certain calculations only for speed regulation in our cars or for assuring the security of the, of the wheels of our cars during the trajectory. And this chip does it, thanks to God, very quickly. Extremely quickly, much quicker than our, the, the chips in the computer can do the calculations. Or in the uh, refrigerators, we have chips that do very specialized tasks uh, uh, with relation to uh, regulating temperature. So it's always good to have a module that is specialized on a certain task. And what we know now from the work of evolutionary psychologists and of the uh, of the archaeologists that were interested in looking into this problem of the human mind, Stephen Mithen, for example, uh, we can hypothesize that species, higher species, vertebrates, etc., have a modular structure of their brain. And also the early humans had this. And the apes have it. And monkeys have it. And what made us humans human was to allow the different modules to establish communication among themselves. So as a, as a person living in the savanna, it's good for me to have a module that is uh, trained on detecting snakes, because snakes are dangerous. So as you see a snake, it immediately I run away. I save my life for that, because of that. And later, when the the different modules become uh, organized in a way that allows the communication among them. It may be a, a cooperation between them that allows to combine insights from different uh, modular, uh, how shall I say, modular regions or modular domains into other modular domains, which is a precondition for creativity for creating new things. An insight into the movement of a snake may allow me to develop a strategy of how to uh, develop a new weapon, for example, for hunting. No. And this is an approach that uh, the uh, evolutionary psychologists are actually, uh, this is written in German, I see here, uh, anyway, uh, are suggesting for human, uh, for, for 
every higher developed uh, organism or animal, and uh, which is very interesting because certain certain modules already exist that are very important for social life exist in uh, apes also in capuchin monkeys and there is a nice movie here that I hope will work. So a final experiment that I want to mention to you is our fair study. Uh, and so this the, the, the became a very famous study and there's now many more because after we did this about 10 years ago uh, it became uh, very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkey and I'm, I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs and with birds and with chimpanzees. Um, this but with Sarah Blossom that started out with capuchin monkey. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber is perfectly fine for them. Now, if you give the partner grapes, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. <laughs> and so if you give them grapes as a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task. They're thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. First piece she eats, uh, and then she sees the other one getting great, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task, and we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us, and that's what she does, and she gets a grape, and she eats it. The other one sees that, she gives a rock to us now, and gets again a cucumber. <laughs> she tests her rock now against the wall. You need to give it to her. And she gets to the So what this shows us is the workings of a very socially very relevant module, and that's the module of justice that, as you see, already exists in other socially living species. And it exists with us still, but uh, of course in cooperation and in communication with other cognitive modules that we share. And taken together, you can illustrate this, for example, uh, this way, where you have this uh, little X here in different, in different uh, designs uh, which symbolize the different modules that ex may exist in the brain, in the mind, specialized for different uh, tasks which in the human development, in the evolution, just started to go together and allowed us to establish creativity and creative acts in for example, transferring our way of uh, treating the stones. For millions of years, we, 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 we hammered stones and used them for, for, uh, for uh, preparing our food, for example, or for killing peop uh, animals or whatever, or defending ourselves. But nobody ever in the, during these millions of years came or developed the idea of forming or shaping antlers of gazelles, for example, or bones of the animals that we were hunting or eating, into tools. These things were only used very recently, only during the time of the departure from Africa, where Homo uh, sapiens, Neanderthalensis, and later uh, sapiens, 
departed from Africa and where obviously their mind was developed enough to transfer their insight of treating stones to bones, to, uh, to, to other materials like antlers, etc., etc., which obviously is the precondition or the necessity for the big Neolithic revolution that was the cradle of our culture to develop. So what we see is that this confluence of the different modules uh, gave the possibility for culture to evolve and of language to evolve. That allowed us to construct something like a thought about that and what is after that. Uh, to construct our burials uh, accordingly, to give the gifts to the dead in order to accompany them to the uh, whatever, afterlife, as you may call it, to use a symbolism that is visible in some of the uh, Cro-Magnon uh, cave paintings, etc., etc. And the one big uh, accompanying achievement was the development of symbolic language. Language, our language or human language is more than communication because communication already exists between machines but they don't understand each other, they just exchange signs. Not even symbols, signs. Um, and only our human language is in contrast to animal languages a symbolic language that uh, developed spontaneously or continuously during the two, three million years. We don't know this yet. But it gave rise to culture, to symbolism, and to the ability to represent, to build pictures, to make pictures, to make uh, uh, plastic uh, forms out of uh, certain materials that were not used for millions of years. For example, in this case, it's uh, I have, uh, ivy that is being used. Ivy is from the elephant, how do you call this? Yeah, okay. So, uh, and one of the most impressive uh, expressions of this early culture is the Neolithic cave paintings. Uh, where many people tend to call these cave paintings a kind of art. But I'm, people are hesitant to use art for this. It can be an expression of boredness, that people were just sitting, you know, didn't know what to do, the hunting was over, so they sit in their caves and paint something. Could be boredness, could be also communication, for example, that's something that they, that scientists think today, that uh, these pictures and icons may be signs for hunting grounds and the animals to tell other people coming to the same uh, cave where the animals can be found. So if we take together all these developments as, uh, and look at the seven ar archaeological indicators that point us or this, that illustrate for us the existence of culture, a long time ago, 65,000 years ago, um, where I'm using the YBP for expressing age, uh, meaning years before present. This is a politically correct uh, use of age instead of saying before or after Christ, because Christ obviously is a culturally laden uh, term. So we say years before present. As we said, burial is important, giving gifts to the death, to adorn your body, to, to make pictures, to have a, or show a rapid technological innovation, and also different technological uh, development in different regions. We have the regional differences to establish uh, long-distance contact and to exchange products, products etc., <coughs> to develop bigger living places, etc., etc. And all this was necessary for the so-called Neolithic revolution to 
happen. And the Neolithic Revolution was something where our culture today uh, took shape and was formed, actually. It presupposed the distribution of the Homo sapiens sapiens across all continents except uh, America, even though America might have been uh, populated already by the first migration wave. It uh, presupposes symbolic language, at, which is a potential or allows us a symbolic understanding. It presupposes, it, uh, presupposes factors that were beyond our own body and beyond our own influence, that was the climate, geography, and biology. Uh, the climate changed drastically uh, about 12,000 years ago. The Ice Age ended, as we can see, quite abruptly here. And the, temp the, the, the world climate got warmer and wetter, whereas before it was cold and dry during the uh, Ice Age. And this allowed the people suddenly to choose among different species, animals and plants, in the Near East, in the so-called Fertile Crescent, where all these necessities for the Neolithic uh, revolution of culture development came together. We had there, we had there species, for example, uh, that were uh, very, very important at the beginning, that was wheat. That's the upmost line, the first line here. The Southwest Asia uh, plants for domestication, wheat, peas, and olive. That were the first plants being domesticated by coincidence, not so much by, by plant thinking and acting, but by coincidence mostly. And there were present some sheep and goats, which were immediately domesticated, because they, they had certain characteristics that made them useful for domestication. The question is, why, became, why was it the Near East that became the cradle of human culture in general? Because there were other regions also, of course, in other continents, other regions where there were animals and plants to be domesticated. The corn, for example, in, uh, in uh, Latin America or in Middle America. But if you look at the distribution of animal candidates for domestication, we have 72 candidates in Eurasia, and 13 of these were actually domesticated. Whereas in Sub-Sahara, Africa, there were 51 candidates and none of them was domesticated. Not even the, the British managed to domesticate the zebra. They tried to domesticate zebra instead of the horses uh, to, for locomotion. But the zebras were not domesticable because of certain genetic uh, characteristics. And North America had 24. Uh, animal species that could have been domesticated, but only one was actually domesticated, which, which was the yama, the, 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 uh, this animal, this camel-like animal in the Andes, which was domesticated by, by the Incas. Australia was very poor. They didn't manage any domestication. Um, so, Let's not look at this. But what characteristics do these domesticable animals need to have in order to be domesticable? First, they must not be the large carnivores. I mean, having a lion in your house is a little bit, I don't know. But if he lets you alive, it's still difficult to feed him with lots of meat. So you should not try to domesticate big carnivores. It's better to have these herbivores, uh, uh, particularly because these also are herd animals. That is, animals that have a social structure within themselves, which makes it easier for the human to take an alpha position, you know, to be obeyed. And which is 
something that stopped the British from domesticating the zebra. Uh, there should be no hardwired nervousness. An animal that's permanently uh, threatened or feels uh, threatened and runs away is not a good uh, candidate. If you cannot, uh, if you cannot ameliorate this uh, condition. And animals that are aggressive are not uh, good candidates, of course, also not. And one of the, these were the preconditions for the development of our culture in the Near East. But for Eura uh, Eurasians, particularly Europeans, becoming so advanced in science and technology during the following thousands of years, the most ultimate factor was for cultural development was the structure of the continents. That is the east-west uh, stretching of the Eurasian landmass. Why is this? It is very simple and very logical if you think about it. Because the exchange of cultural products and of cultural technology was only possible if you stayed in the same climate zone, for example, agricultural plants that are agricultural, uh, uh, that are important for agriculture, can easily be transported in the east-west direction. So, for example, from Europe to Asia, from Asia to Europe. But nearly impossible across the different climate zones that exist in Africa, or the different climate zones that exist in the two American continents. So the coincidence of an east-west stretch of a land mass was one of the big components that led to our development that gave us the, an advantage relative to other people uh, in Africa or in, in Americas. Uh, and that allowed, at the end, colonization. Because a technical advantage, because of these conditions and other coincidences, uh, allowed us to develop technology much faster than in other cultures, and created a gap, a technological gap, between Euro-Asian cultures and the other cultures that were later colonized with whatever justification there may be. And of course, there are in every culture development some proximal factors that uh, were necessary for the further development of the culture that first came up in the Near East. For example, think of plates. In the morning when you take a cup or a plate for your breakfast, you're eating from a technological invention from the Near East 10,000 years ago. Because that was the time when, for the first time in, in, in the history of, of humankind, the people discovered that you can burn clay and make something like porcelain dishes. No? OK, anyway, um, the one interesting thing that we must keep in mind is or that, is in, that we should consider is the migration of the crops that were developed and uh, domesticated in the Near East. If you look here, by about 9,000 years before today, the crops were distributed here and domesticated uh, largely also into uh, uh, Anatolia, also what is today Turkey. And it took thousands of years for the crops and agriculture to arrive in, well, not to speak about north, northern uh, Europe, for 4,500 years before, before today, uh, but also to central Europe, which was 7,000 years. It took 7,000 years for this cultural achievement to arrive there. Sorry, no, it took uh, 2,000 years to arrive there. But 2,000 years is a lot of generations. And one may wonder why such a useful invention didn't travel faster. Uh, if you look at the genetic 
indicators of the migrations. We can see that uh, using the present distribution of the mitochondrial haplogroup J, that it was primarily women, and of course their families, who distributed, transported agricultural uh, capacity to Europe in these waves that you can see here. Uh, showing a very useful aspect of uh, genetic analysis and of genetic marker analysis to see the distribution or the spread of culture that we all use nowadays across the European continent, coming uh, by the carried by the women more or less as the experts in agriculture to Europe. So when they came to Europe, of course, there existed the hunter-gatherers. They coexisted to a certain time, uh, for a certain time. Uh, and they existed in Europe until 5,000 before present. So 3,000 before Christ. They used the same caves as the new uh, migratory immigrants and coexisted for thousands of years. That's, that's important to think about. There is this, if you may call it primitive way of existence as hunter-gatherer in the usually not very friendly European climate in winter. And there is this more progressive, technologically advanced group of agriculturists who entered Europe. And they coexist and everybody sees the quality of life of the others. And I dare say that the agriculturists had a better life than the hunter-gatherers. But they didn't mix. Hmm? The hunter-gatherers probably thought, and this is very similar to the Austrian way of thinking, uh, I don't care. I don't need that. Why do I need this fucking agriculture? It's just work. I go to my hunting and I collect my roots, etc., etc. Something like this mindset may have been at place in the confrontation of the of the agriculturists, the farmers, and the hunter-gatherers in Europe. For them, living so long in a parallel existence side by side, and one knows that they virtually shared the boundaries. They were mixing uh, slowly, but uh, nevertheless in a steady way, uh, by mixing by exogamy. The women of the hunter-gatherers marrying into the families or into the uh, company of the, of the new agri uh, farmers. And there was probably no exogamy <laughs> because women knew where it's better to live, of course. So they wouldn't exchange a sedentary life to a life in the jungle, which was European forests at this time. So let's finish here. Uh, with, uh, to, uh, with the lecture today and to see you hopefully in two weeks again. Thank you.